we're back with Rob. And Rob, you were you, you after you uh, took a little break and load up that uh, that uh, Oliva very V. Nice, very, very nice, nice uh, uh, cigar. Oliva V cigar. Yeah. Um, so my friend, uh, my friend Jim Demer, he used to he was a drummer on the on the uh, We're All Gonna Die uh, Generation Kill record. But when I first got sober, um, he was one of my biggest uh, fans because he he couldn't stand me when I was a drunk, and uh, I used to like uh, I hung around bands and stuff. They had like they had this band called Rip House, and I'd go and I'd help them load their gear in and shit, and and then uh, I'd get drunk and then I would would never load out. But <laughs> but uh, I went to try out for this band one time and and I was so drunk and I I just that's a guitar player though, right? No, I was no as, oh okay. I'd never done it before though. That was like, but I, didn't, you know, I was, I was. But you were, awful. you played guitar. I though, played right? guitar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, but you know, when you're, when you're a raging alcoholic, guitars come second and third. You know what I mean? Doesn't so everything come second? Pretty and much. Third? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Wow. So you know, um, but that was the night that I quit drinking, and and Jim used to. He came to my. Uh, so I I, I would do like a celebration every year that i got so stayed sober he would show up and it was a very cool thing and uh you know um we didn't talk for a while but we're we're starting to talk again and uh you know um yeah yeah Dude, gotta relight that huh just the edge because i just lit it so so when Exodus wasn't the first band that you played in, right? Actual band. You had you. Did you play in any any <coughs> other things? Even you know, like that you played a gig at. Did you was the. So I had a band. I had a band with my friend Craig Safola, who I did the Exodus DVD with. He's uh -huh. a, he's an editor and he uh -huh. plays drums. And me and him uh, had a band, um, and we we went into a studio. We wrote like a bunch of songs, and you know, I played guitar, I played the bass, and I sang. And I, but it was, you know, it was very, um, it was very simple. Um, it wasn't, um, it was just, you know, it was just, we we're just rock songs, man. You know what I mean? We we're just, we were having fun. Um, you know, me and him were both kind of like nerdy kind of dudes. So we, he didn't really drink. So that's why we, I think we, we became friends because he didn't want to go to a bar and hang out. He'd rather just say, hey, let's make music and do stuff. So we just did. We just, and we, you know, had a really good time doing it. We played a couple of shows. We did, I think, two shows, maybe three. Um, and um, so that was the extent of my playing. I never really did much more than that. Um, Exodus was like really one of the first uh -huh. things I did. So it was one of the one of the first things you did. Even though I mean, I had done stuff, but not not a, not on any kind of consistent level. Uh -huh. You know, you're talking about. So me and Craig hung out for maybe two years and 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 did and, and, when, and, we did and how old two, were you three gigs. Time? I was 26, 27. Okay, I had just gotten sober. Now, when I got sober, so early 90s basically is when you're going. Yeah, out. right. Early 90s, 93, 94, 95. You know. Um, I was listening to a lot of punk rock. I was listening. Were you to attending of, shows in New York? Because I mean, it was a good hub for it. Maybe that was yeah. a little bit later, but even so, there was still sick of it all and 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 no, leeway was, yeah. and bands. There was there was some good bands, good hardcore in New York bands. I wasn't really doing that. Chromags man. Mags and you know. I would go see the Chromags. I've seen them a bunch of times. I'd see the sick of all. I mean, I did go to shows, but. I was going to more like metal show. I went and saw Slayer with on with, um, Machine Head's first tour. That was like ninety four, right? Yes, ninety five. Yeah. So I saw that show with Biohazard, and I'd go see Biohazard in New York. And and uh, but um, the the truth was, is when I was drinking, uh, if I didn't somehow force my way into the show, which I did see, I saw Exodus, I saw Megadeth, I saw Metallica. I went to all the you know, the bigger bands when they were coming through, even though they weren't that big yet. Right. Um, but I was going to all that shit. I was going to more... Where was the venue that you would go to? Rob? I was going to the Scrap Bar. I was going to the Continental. I was going to CBGB's. I uh -huh. was going... Where'd you see us at when you when you saw us? I saw you guys. Remember that show? You'll remember it. It's It was in Lakeland, Florida, when the stage collapsed, when the barrier yeah, totally. collapsed. Yeah, the guy I broke his that. leg. Yeah, his leg went the other way. Yeah. I've told that story a hundred times. Dude, I was... Know? 
Wasn't that like a, an ice rink in like Tampa or something like that? that they Me and my like- friends fucking created that mayhem. We were in the pit. You guys came out, boom, and we just fucking went crazy. And we pushed all these people, and that fucking thing collapsed. Well, they didn't build it correctly. It wasn't, it wasn't our didn't. fault, but it was. Yeah, right. yeah, they but, didn't build but it correctly. But we wanted it. I would, dude, I was going to go, but I was diving off that fucking stage. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, my friend was the one that pulled the cop into the crowd. You remember when that happened? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That was me and my friends. Because they were, the cops, that was the show I <laughs> they saw. They were across the stage. They had, and, but they had no control of what was going on None. there. None. They Dude, thought we they were trying to tell fire. us what to do. And we were like, hey, you know, like, and the guy was yelling at me, and I, I kind of looked at him, and I said. I was there, dude. I go, these fans will fuck your world if you we even did. touch me. And we, they're like, yeah, Sandro, yeah. And I was like, there was like five or 6,000 people in that place, and they had, it was plywood with uh, two by fours that were nailed to the thing. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as. It, as soon as you started. It went so no, r- that when when Celtic Frost like was, it. when Celtic Frost was playing, oh. no one gave a fuck. No one no, was right, moshing. Right, no one's, right, right. We, the fucking house lights were still on while they were playing. It was right. like this crazy. And then as soon as fucking, I think four, you guys, four, it was four, four, fifth song. It was done by yeah. dad. It was done. You guys opened with fabulous. Yes. Right. So when you opened with fabulous, dude, I came from the back. I was, dude, I was so drunk. I mean, that I was, I was so drunk. I drank like a bottle of vodka on the way there, like just, and I was most like, Texas fan, most yeah. metal fans did back then. Dude, That's fuck. what you guys did. That's Dude. what we did. Fuck, we were. And I was gonna. We've been going. Hey, you got any drugs too, yeah, Rob? Come was, on, let's go. I was fuck. diving off that fucking stage. I was stage diving that show. I was gonna fucking yeah. And then all that craziness happened. They lit cars on fire. Man. Oh yeah. They were throwing bottles at cops. They, they were, were throwing fucking, bottles at the buses. Yeah. And we were like, we wanted to play. So I, so look, so we walked away from that after all the mayhem and the fucking insanity. Um, I no longer liked Anthrax because when remember when the cops were trying to tell everybody to sit down and the wave of bottles and shit that came and Scott Ian was standing there. Like from then on, I was like, I'm no longer an Anthrax fan because fuck them guys, man. They were fucking hanging with the cops trying to tell everyone to calm down. Yeah. We're like, fuck you, man. We're at a fucking metal show. Yeah, How about right. you get the fucking cops out of here and let's fucking get this on? Yeah, yeah we were, we were, we were grilling. The cops made us go on our bus. They're like, get out of here. Get on our bus. And I'm standing there and I'm like, you know, hey, man. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I go, I'm just trying to talk to the guys. The fans want to be cool. And they're like, get on your bus now. Yeah. You're going to get arrested. I go, you go to touch me. I have about 300 people standing right here just swallow you. And they're all, yeah, yeah. 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 Because I just got on my bus. And about yeah. But I still talk about those. Those are the times. Right? So when I got sober, I didn't go to, I didn't go anywhere for like a year. I didn't, I didn't go anywhere. Bars, clubs. Matter of fact, it was like maybe, a, maybe like a year. And then I went out to California and started hanging out with TSOL and, and, um, all those guys, um, Jack Grisham was one of the guys that helped me stay sober in the first, in the very beginning. Still friends to this day, uh-huh. see him all the time. Uh, love Jack to death, and he, you know, one of my, you know, one of my, you know, I just love the guy, man. He was, you know, one of those people that he yeah, I saved remember my seeing life. them in the punk days back here. Yeah. In oh yeah, they played many he times just, in the Bay Area. Yeah, man. So you know him and and uh, you know just a handful of people that really helped me because you know when I first got sober, man, I, I so I had hair down on my ass and I was just a mess and i just i shaved my head i didn't shave my head i cut my hair short and i i stopped wearing black t-shirts and i kind of like just kind of had to figure out who i was and so um by hang going to southern california i kind of like adopted that part of my life that i started wearing like you know um you know vans and and you know surf kind of shit you know shorts I mean? and, right and I, you know but i still you know like and most of those guys they loved metal i mean acdc was like a you know like a factor you know and always had been like you know uh so that's the genesis of it all for everyone i yeah. think is acdc because it's <laughs> it rocks but it's hard it's it's, it's got it's edge rock and roll, man. it's rock and roll it's oh, great yeah. rock and roll so you know so you know that you know all those influences that, that i had but i never you know what's funny is i never so so about 10 years go by uh, in sobriety and i i go through a lot of changes i, I got to figure out who i was because you got to remember when i started drinking i was 15 so i completely stunted my 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 life as is becoming a grown up becoming uh, learning how to to live life you know as a a functioning adult and i did it by drinking through all that so now here i am 25 years old but i think like a 15 year old emotionally i was a fucking mess so i 
was going to fucking therapy and I was trying to just not be, I was, I was terrified of being drunk. That was my, cause I'm not a good guy. I'm not a nice guy. I'm not fun to be around. I'm not, uh, I don't like myself. I fucking hated looking in the mirror. When did it, when did, how long did it take you for you to realize that to go, you know, did that full time? 10 years. 10 years. And then when you finally realized it. I was 10 you, years sober. Really? It took me 10 years. 10 years to be comfortable in my own skin uh -huh. and know who I was. And there was like this weight lifted off of me. They, you know, I, there was this, there was a moment in my life when I, you know, um, I was, you know, my parents, I love my parents to death. And, but for a long time, I didn't. It's not that I didn't love them. I just didn't give a fuck. I just didn't want anything to do with them. And, and I, I was 10 years sober. Resentful? Yeah. Fuck uh, yeah. You, on your you, own merit or because you feel that you were robbed of your childhood for things that they did? Their decision. I, I felt that their decisions, that I felt like they abandoned me and they left me on my own. And they left me to, to with people that, that weren't really good for me. And, and, uh, and then there was, a, and I, I blame them for it. And, you know, so, and I, and I, but I didn't know how to not like, that's the, one of the things that was really confusing, but sobriety and therapy and, 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 you know, being honest with myself about it, I didn't understand that they were they were just doing the best they could they were young right. kids they like they did the best they could and unfortunately they made mistakes which which now so now it's in my court to forgive them for it but i couldn't because i didn't understand that yet it took me about 10 years of sobriety so i drove to my mom's house i got on my motorcycle i gave away all my possessions i, I gave my apartment away i got on my motorcycle and i left los angeles no i left new york oh you left new york too my that's, mom that's was, what you went. my mom was living in florida right I drive to my mom's, and uh, so. And you're 25 at this time. No, 25. no, no. I'm, I'm 35. Oh, you're 30. Oh, this is 10 years later. 10 this years is now so, 10 years yeah, later. 35. And I drive to my mom's house. I hadn't talked to my mom in like two years. Two years, not a phone call, not nothing. Like, just spiteful shit son behavior. You know what I mean? Just, just not good stuff. And I was sober, and I, I was, and I, it, it bothered me to my core, but I, I didn't know what to do. So. I, I reached out to my friend and he says, dude, you, you gotta, you gotta sit down with her and you gotta, you gotta say you're sorry for, you don't have to say, you don't have to accuse her. You need to say you're sorry for your shit and your shit alone. And I was like, okay. And I drove, I got on my motorcycle and I drove to, to Florida from New York, all back roads, no highways, no freeways. Really? It took like 12 days just me on a, on just a GS, GSXR 750 to take my time, fucking get to my mom's house. I know where she lives. I go to my mom's house and there's a, a fucking waffle house, like a mile from her house. Uh, and it was like 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, and she, I don't think I've ever told her this. Maybe I did. Um, but I, I, I smoked cigarettes at the time. And, um, I sat at this waffle house cause you could smoke in a waffle house. Probably still can for yeah, Florida. You probably <laughs> still can. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this waffle house and I'm drinking that awful shit coffee and I'm smoking. I smoked a whole pack of cigarettes. Now it's like three in the morning. I'm fucking shaking. I'm drinking ten cups of coffee, and I'm fucking smoked a pack of cigarettes. And I was like, "Fuck it!" And I just went to my mom's house and I knocked on the door, and she opened the door, and she just started crying. And I gave her a hug, and we sat out on her porch at three in the morning. We sat there for two, three hours, drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. And I told her, I told her. I let her off the hook. I forgave her, and it, it freed me. And you feel better about yourself now. Absolutely. It freed me. It freed me from all that shit. And uh, it was like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. So I went and I did it to my dad, which was the hardest one. Cause, was he in Florida as well? No, he was in Kentucky. And uh, that one was tough. At the same time, did you do this, Rob? Like no, like, I did my dad like a, like a year later. Like a year later. Yeah, I needed some time to figure. It, out. it was rough, man. So I, I I stayed with my mom for a couple weeks, and and uh, and then I went to L.A. Rode my motorcycle to California, and I started over. I just I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna. My goal was to be a uh, uh, scuba diving instructor because I had gotten into scuba diving like a couple years before, and I was going down to the Keys a lot, and um, so. 
that was my goal. My goal was to come to LA. I was going to work on a fucking dive boat and eventually maybe I'll buy my own boat or whatever. I'll figure, I'll figure, I don't I really have, I didn't have a plan, but I felt free. I felt like free of this huge burden. So like, maybe six months eight months go by and i i called my dad and i did it over the so me and my dad actually talked once before but i i did it over the phone with him and i did basically the same conversation i had with my mom i had with my dad and um we were crying was he in the, and like like your mother like kind of relieved that yeah. you had shown up and yeah. this is being finally taken care of yeah because you know it was one of those things where it was just you know my dad's an awesome grandfather. <laughs> he's That's a, great. You know, he's an awesome. He's one. Of, he's one. He's a beautiful human being. And my mom is a. They're both beautiful human beings. And Good both, for you. Good for you know, them. And That's so, great. When I did, when I after I spoke with my dad, there was like this this huge weight lifted off, and I I walked around the world different. Like when I used to walk into a room, no matter how I appeared to feel or when I appeared on the outside, on the inside, I felt everyone was better than me. Like I, that, that was that feeling I always walked around with that uncomfortable feeling in my own skin that I don't like who I am that, um, you know, and when, when that, when those, when that happened, I ended up calling like an, a couple ex-girlfriends and doing the same thing. Hey man, remember when I was drinking and we were, you know, and kind I kind of like a 12 just, step kind of like, kind like, of a little bit of it. It's called the ninth, but yeah, the ninth, ninth, ninth you step. just pulled the step out. I did. I did. You didn't did go through any of the other ones. Is that one? I made amends to all the people that I harmed, man. And I fucking, I, I felt better. So then I get this and then, you know, I'm living in LA. I'm happy, man. I'm, I'm like, you know, and we're in the nineties in LA right now. No, right? this is early. This is 2002. Oh, 2002. Okay. So early. Right. So I was, yeah, this already is 35, 36 years old. Right. Wow. So my buddy, Jason, who plays in prong and he plays in Corey Taylor's new band, Jason, uh, Christopher, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Jason is one of my closest friends in the world. And he was in this band called new dead radio and they were on tour. So I arrived in LA and they were gone on tour. So he says, Hey man, I'm leaving my key with Johnny Chow, who's working, who's Johnny Chow, fucking Soulfly Johnny Chow. Oh, yeah, oh, Johnny. Yeah. He was working the door at the Viper Room, and, and he had the key for Jason's apartment. So I pull up on my motorcycle, and, hey, Johnny, I'm Rob. He goes, oh, here's the key, man. He goes, dude, I said, I'm going to go take a shower. He said, yeah, come back, man. Fucking come hang out. So I, the first night in L.A., right? Go to Jason's. He lives right next door to the Viper Room. Fucking... <clears throat> go take a shower. I've been on the road for like, you know, 12, 13 days. I'm fucking gross. Uh, you know, I put on my fucking pants and decent clean shirt and I go to the Viper room hanging out with Johnny outside and this fucking chick walks up and she's blah, 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 blah. And I'm fucking 20 minutes later, dude, she's like, let's get out of here. <clears throat> and, and Johnny, and behind her, Johnny's like, what the fuck? I'm like, I don't know, man. So I went and I, fucking bang this chick the first the night in welcome LA. To, welcome, welcome to, to LA. Welcome to LA. about, ooh, we're going <laughs> to reel this guy in. Yeah, huh? what, Johnny, when I talk to Johnny now, he still tells me that story. Because, dude, I couldn't believe that happened. I'm like, me neither, man. And she was a fucking, she was a 10. It wasn't like there was some drunken skank. No, this was a fucking... Like hot. hot LA chick, yeah, man. So and th that sold it right there, huh? Uh, yeah, man. So the free place, <laughs> right next to the Viper Room, and the chick wants to bang you after fucking two hours. Not even, do dude. It was twenty really? minutes. Amazing. Twenty minutes. Yeah. So I started working at the Dragonfly as a bartender, and I ended up. Um, I had a little bit of carpentry skills, so they needed a new stage at the Dragonfly. So I built the stage. I built the bar that was out in the back of the Dragonfly. There's like an outdoor wooden bar i built that i built the, the closet for all the alcohol that goes on the top above the uh above the stage i did a bunch of work in there and i was working there at night i was bartending i was uh, on some nights i was bar backing on the busy busy nights and i was making good money i was working for uh live um for uh what's that company what's that big company that does all the shows now live nation live nation i was working for live nation so i was doing Coachella. Oh yeah. For two weeks every year, I was doing stagecoach for two weeks. So that was like three grand for two weeks of work. Really? Like six grand for two for a month. Then I was working uh, at the El Rey, loading in bands like Queens of the Stone Age, and getting out and fucking watching band after band after band. And then Scott Koenig calls me. And he says, "Hey man." Well. He says, "Hey man, some dude uh, 
just uh, fucked up the floor at the Palladium, dragging an amp across the floor, and they fired him. Do you want to go work a, a fucking six week tour? And I was with, I was working for Navarro at the time. I said, Yeah, man, I'm done working. I'm done. This is my last night. Yeah, I can be there. What time do you want? It? Two in the morning. I go, I'll be there. So I fucking packed up Navarro's shit and went to uh, put it at the studio and packed it away. And I fucking went home, took a shower, grabbed some clothes, and jumped on the Exodus bus. And uh, Steve Escaval was singing, right? And uh, walked on the bus. And it, now, how got no, you no. got into you got into? Teching. I was teching right you through were teching. Live Nation, man. Yeah, it was you were really teching through Live Nation. Jeff Hickey. Jeff, Jeff got you. Jeff got me into it. He's not doing well right now. That's what I heard. I don't know. I, I haven't talked to him in a long time. Uh, well, if you're out there, I haven't talked to him. Yeah. Well. yeah, but that's what he. I uh, love Jeff, man. He was a yeah. good dude. He was fucking crazier than fuck. <laughs> he's the second craziest person I've ever known yeah, in my life. Yeah, he's pretty fucking crazy. Yeah, I can't. Uh, yeah, he was a hard guy to be around because he was just so fucking crazy. I loved him to death, man. But he was, he was hardcore as fuck. And fucking sober when I hung out with him. Because when he got high, I couldn't hang out anymore. I was like, yeah, I can't do it. But he was when in he, that job. Well, when I he knew was him sober. in the 80s when we were just like, oh, dude. when it was on, when it was on, because it was on for all of us in the 80s. But mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of, you actually kind of caught it as it, they weren't as wild anymore. You know what I mean? Like, Gary, no, Gary, man. There, there's no drugs anymore. No, anymore. I was the most so, dangerous fucker in, in yeah, Exodus, and yeah, I didn't even drink. Yeah, so you know what I mean? mean? You caught them at, at a point where they didn't do anything. I mean, we we ended, we ended that. We ended yeah. that, you know. No, they were all. So when I met Gary, Gary, well, Gary no, was no clean. Drink, booze, but no, no Gary drugs. was clean. Rick wasn't. And, yeah. and, um, and Tom had just gotten clean right recent right right yeah it was a mess too. and uh you know so uh i go on the exodus tour with megadeth and uh and then at the last show i sang what the fuck is that song the salad song like a salad Damn. oh uh, a deranged deranged so i got up and i sang deranged God, i had to think yeah i know um did deranged did you know at that point you were going to no. try out or no. they just... No, I, dude, I, here's the thing that's fucking awesome, right? I had no aspirations. I was happy living in L.A., doing what I was doing. Why did I was you just, torture yourself like that, Rob? I was just that, banging Rob? chicks, <laughs> fucking <laughs> having fun, making money. Dude, I was making fucking money and fucking living. Yeah, you went it to was, making no money. I, I know no. what you did. I know what you did. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, I know. I had to I had to, get, ever done. I had to get out because, yeah. I mean, to, it was, and, a, and to it be was honest, the dumbest, I mean, smartest thing I've like, ever to, done. To, to, dumbest, smart, exactly. And it's like, it was something that, I really didn't want to relinquish, but I had a wife and three kids and I couldn't cut it on what they were trying to, what we were trying to do at that time. And yeah. I, I had a good job. I had, I was a union carpenter and being at home 1100 bucks a week and all my family had benefits and stuff. And I had come home right before the mega death thing. It was like maybe a month before there was some South American stuff in there. And I came home and, um, I was only supposed to be home for a week. And, um, I was then we were going to go back out again, so I went to go to my job, and you know my nickname was Rockstar. Obviously, at to everybody at the job. It's my fucking it's small, my nickname now. Of my course job. it is. Yeah. And so I fucking uh, I, and I and I was at a small door company. I did commercial doors. You know, I put in commercial doors for the union union carpenter, and I worked at a small company. And um, I go there, and I go on the board, and I don't see my name on there, but two days, and I says, hey, the owner. I says to the owner, I says, hey, um. Why? And he goes, hey, I'm rock star. We need to have a talk. So I come in there and he goes, hey, check it out. It's not right for you to go on vacation every other month and a half. I go, dude, you have no clue. It's not vacation. He goes, I know, but I have a business to run here and I know other guys. So I can't give you more hours. Than so that. the other guys were, were complaining. Yeah. Other guys were like, you know, what a like, bunch of cunts. That's what I said. But I said, what a who cares? bunch of fucking but, cunts, but, but man. But I did understand the fact no, that. No, fuck them. That, 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 that the dude was at a small company and we Whatever. only had like seven guys. And, and cause I mean, with exes, we're I'm coming. I'm gone for six weeks. I'm coming for a month. Then I'm gone for another six weeks. And he's all, I need somebody who's going to be here consistently. Mm. And then I was like, well, I make this here, but I make this here. So I, it was something that I didn't want to do. And yeah. I'm not happy about how I did it. 
and I can't take that back. Yeah. And, but and, and believe me, I wasn't the nicest way to do it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's just like, check it out. I'm uh, not coming back like mm. ever. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just get somebody else to do the show you have to play tomorrow in Mexico. And then right. I fucked them. And I know that. And I said it to this day. I will own up to that, that I can't take that back. I try to make it back now by performance or whatever. Yeah. But I, I fucking, I, if I could have it back another way, I would have never done it like that. Because that's not the character that I carry myself in. Yeah. And that's not how I built it. So that's how my part of that went to it. You know what I mean? And it was something that I was really reluctant because... You know, Rob, I've worked my whole life with this band and legacy and all that to become this and do this and just to go, well, fuck, <coughs> I just can't do this anymore. See you guys. You know what I mean? It was hard to relinquish it, but I knew being a father, you know, I had three children and a wife and I had to do, I had to, needed a steady paycheck and I needed my benefits paid for the kids and stuff, you know, and, you know, you know I don't know if you know the union, if you don't work so many hours, they won't cover they you won't medically. Cover you. And so yeah. I, I couldn't do it anymore. And then I get to work and yeah, I'm on the, I'm, I got a fucking family of five and a mortgage and car payments. And I'm on the fucking clock this week for 16 hours. And it was like, what do I do? Go end up broke going on tour with Exodus or stay broke as a carpenter. And I just, I had to pull the plug at that time, and that yeah. was kind of again. I didn't like that. Well, I did. the luxury that I had that you didn't have was I didn't have a wife. Right. I didn't have a fucking girlfriend. Right. I did. I was living. Dude, I lived in a. I lived in a cool little apartment, man. I had a motorcycle. I had a nice. I had a '69 fucking Buick that I drove around. I fucking ALL lowered and fucking. I was just living, and and I was cool, and I was like, yeah, man. I'll f-. So let's take a break. Let me uh, take a break. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to go right back into how that how that kind of went down on the Exodus tour. Yeah. <laughs> 